to Todd Curtis, who's an aviation analyst and the founder of airsafe.com. He's with us live from San Francisco. Welcome to Al Jazeera. Thanks for your time. Um, Todd Curtis, we're hearing that uh, Jordan is announcing the closure of its airspace, and there are reports also that Israel is uh, closing its airspace. What does this mean? This is, a, in my opinion, out of an abundance of caution. The kinds of aircraft that are apparently heading toward Israel aren't necessarily targeting airliners or other aircraft. Uh, the kind of drones that were mentioned earlier wouldn't be a, a hazard to air traffic. However, there are going to be a lot of unknowns in this situation, including any sorts of defensive activity on the part of Israel and others. So airliners, even if they were not uh, told to not fly in that space, the management of those companies uh, have taken steps. In fact, looking at a live picture from one of the tracking services, there are a lot of aircraft going to the east and west of Jordan in Israel, but very few in those airspaces. Do you expect other countries to follow suit in the region? As far as avoiding that airspace, uh, certainly. Uh, the countries in question, any country, has the right to open or close its airspace. Uh, Jordan has already uh, stated that. And given what might be happening in Israel, even if Israel does not officially close that airspace, most airliners, uh, most airline management companies, even uh, executive jets would avoid that airspace simply because of the hazard that exists, not just from uh, military activity, but from the reported jamming of GPS signals. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that point. That's what I wanted to get on to next, because some countries uh, in the past, uh, recently actually, not in the past, past few days, uh, have been reporting uh, GPS disruption. Countries like Jordan, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, Syria, uh, Lebanon. What is that down to? Well, the cause, uh, why it's being done, there's many ways that this can be uh, done because the signals from the GPS satellites can be overwhelmed by uh, defensive measures. But with respect to aircraft operations, uh, GPS navigation is one of the key uh, sets of navigational tools that most airliners, even small aircraft, have. It's not the only tool. And in fact, in the U.S. and elsewhere, there's actually plans in place to use a limited set of navigational signals to take off and land from airports should GPS be compromised. And I'm pretty certain that around the world that sort of backup plan is in place, either with individual aircraft uh, operating companies or with nations, that if you do not have the primary means of navigation, which is GPS in many cases, there are secondary means, many of which existed before GPS, that can allow aircraft to fly safely. What are the reasons why a country or a state or whoever would want to jam GPSs? Well, on a state level, that is a state level actor like a, like a, like a national authority, there could be some immediate uh, national security issues that would cause them to uh, jam the signals. And as I stated before, the GPS satellites are sort of like radio stations. That is, they broadcast continuously. and it's up to the receiving area as to whether or not they just want to accept the signals or jam them. In most cases, radio signals that are like that aren't jammed. Of course, during the Cold War, there is a lot of that going on, especially in the, uh, the countries aligned with the Soviet Union, jamming radio signals, shortwave and others from the uh, Western states. In the modern era, uh, because GPS is so heavily used by civilian and military and government entities, there's usually a lot of incentive not to jam the signals, because if you're jamming it for one uh, user, you're jamming it for all users. Right. What kind of impact does it have then on sort of commercial aviation? Well, in commercial aviation, again, there are procedures in place for that just about every airline has and many uh, smaller operators. That is, if GPS isn't operating, there are certain kinds of things you can't do. For example, in the United States, many of the uh, approaches into aircraft, into airports, rather, that are precision approaches. That is, uh, in the old days, they used to use something called the instrument landing system. Well, that still is in place, but there's also GPS-based systems that have as good and sometimes even better uh, fidelity than some of the older systems. But if those GPS systems go down, or if they're in somehow or another there's a problem with it, there are, in many cases, a backup system you can use. 
And if that airport does not have a backup system, perhaps that aircraft can't fly there anymore. And uh, just a final thought from you, I mean, to put this sort of all into context, give us an idea of how much traffic there actually is in the air. Well, in the modern era, there are several services that use the signals that are broadcast by just about every airliner where you can go online and look at and see what traffic is happening. And I looked at that just a few minutes before this interview. And there's still a considerable number of airliners flying to and from uh, the Middle East area. And most of them are taking a route that goes over eastern Iraq going north and south, and another set of routes going over uh, western Egypt. And there's still dozens of aircraft in the air. And in, at least for now, there's no real sense that there is possible military activity that's aimed at high-flying aircraft. Uh, if that were the case, then you wouldn't see that traffic going on. But should that change, should there be a aerial aspect to whatever is going on, then you might see a, uh, a very big reduction in civilian airliners flying in that area. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you for speaking to us from San Francisco. Thank you for having me. Well, let's now bring in Sultan Barakat. He's a professor of public policy at Hamad bin Khalifa University. Welcome back to Al Jazeera. So now we have this development. Uh, Israel is now confirming that dozens of drones have been launched from Iran uh, towards Israel. First, give me your initial reading on this Iranian retaliation. Well, first I'd like to relate it to what's going on in Gaza, because I think what's happening, uh, Netanyahu is really getting his way in two, in, in two ways. First, he's distracting the whole world from Gaza. Right. And the story has moved from the atrocities that he's committing in Gaza into the potential of Iran retaliating to the attack and so on. And the second, second which is also important, is, is by going for this embassy in Damascus, he knew that he would provoke a reaction from Iran, that Iran would have no choice but to do something. Whether this is going to be effective or not, we'll see in a few hours. But uh, he knew that they would react. And by them reacting, he will silence any criticism coming from the White House for his operations in Gaza. And in fact, the opposite. He's now lined them all up again, France, United Kingdom, uh, the U.S., to support him in defending himself from what he's now framing as an unprovoked attack by, by Iran. And this is what's going on at the moment. I just sent a message to my brother in Amman, asking him to check the GPS. And he said his phone shows that he's in, above Lebanon. So what they've done with this must be with the support of the United States and Israel, they jammed the, uh, the GPS system uh, between Israel and, and Iran. Right. I would sus I suspect this is just to uh, make sure that those drones uh, are not able to reach their targets uh, accurately. Yeah, I mean, I know that um, um, we'll obviously have to wait to see what sort of impact yes. these drones have and whether they'll also be intercepted, correct? Well, it's a very odd way to react, to be honest, given the capabilities Iran has. We know that they don't have the um, aircraft, the jets, to attack Israel, but they do have long-range missiles, ballistic missiles, etc. Man, even Iraq had it uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, but to go for the drones, which are not very fast, they take a long time to come in, uh, they're going to have to cross a number of bases that are already operated by the Americans. They can shoot them down before they come to Israel. The Iron Dome in Israel. It doesn't really look like an attack that is intended to cause a much, much harm. So what sort it of reminds me, is behind this attack? It reminds then? me of the, of the response they did in 2020 against the American bases in Iraq, where the bases were emptied before the attack. Uh, took place. It allows them to stand up in front of their population to say, we, we've done what we could, uh, but uh, we're going to stop at this. You know, it was, it's not really intended to be as devastating as it could have been. Had they, for example, asked Hezbollah to bomb directly from northern uh, Lebanon, well, the attack would have been different. Exactly that. I mean, is it significant that the drones were launched from Iran itself and not from, let's say, Iraq, Syria, or Lebanon? It is significant in the sense that this is about them uh, protecting their standing amongst their allies within the axis of resistance. That now we were attacked. Uh, they consider the embassy as part of their sovereign territory. Uh, we were attacked directly. We will respond from Iran directly. But as I said, I think it's strange that they would do it with drones with this long distance. 
How much pressure were the Iranians under to respond to that Israeli attack on their consulate in Damascus? I mean, they're, they're, they're under pressure, but they, they did not really have to do it, if, if that makes any sense, in the sense that uh, from 2011 until today, Israel has attacked 300 times or more Iranian targets in Syria and Lebanon. And uh, Iran responded to none. Uh, why they chose to respond this time, it's, it's a question mark. And, and for some of, you know, if you look at it from a conspiracy theory, you think, are they really supporting now Netanyahu or are they working against Netanyahu? Because they've given him a way out of the moral tide that has turned against him. You know, the whole world is, Israel has been on a sliding slope for the last 10, for the last two, three weeks. And on the 1st of April, he went out on purpose to provoke them through this embassy. And now by, their, by them reacting, they will help him really reposition himself as the victim uh, in the region. But in some ways, I mean, they were put between a sort of a rock and a hard place, weren't they? Because they, they had to look like they were doing something. And my guest from Iran a short time ago was saying there was a lot of public pressure domestically on the government to do something? Uh, I'm sure there is, but there are many other ways if they wanted to be more effective that they could have uh, done. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, I, it's very difficult to say. We, we'll see what happens in the coming few hours. But the likelihood, my, my money is on, they will not cause much harm. How do you think, is there going to be an Israeli retaliation? I mean, we know that the, uh, the head of CENTCOM was in Israel and is in Israel, and he was reportedly coordinating the Israeli response to the Iranian response. What do you expect that to be? If this is similar to what happened in 2020, there will be no retaliation. It is just designed to allow the Iranians to uh, relieve some pressure, and everything will go back to normal. If it's not, then uh, yes, Israel could be retaliating. And the worst scenario, Israel will obviously will not retaliate itself. They will use the United States to retaliate. The United States is in full alert now. Their forces are in the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, and uh, they have the capability to, to retaliate. And that will do go back the appetite? to... Do they have the appetite to retaliate? I mean, do they want to get uh, brought into this in principle, escalation? No, in principle, no. I mean, Biden, all his doctrine has been about withdrawing from the Middle East, withdrawing from Afghanistan, focusing on China, focusing on Russia. Uh, I'm sure the administration would not want to do it. But are they left with a choice? That's, I, I, I don't know. I think Netanyahu is, is definitely uh, now uh, drawing the game. He's, he's the man who's dictating the rules. Okay. Uh, Sultan Barakat, we'll uh, let you go for now. Thank you so much for Thank that you. analysis. Well, let's recap. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.